Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Liz Callahan. I am uh, currently the Acting Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Wayside Cleanup. Um, and I want to thank you all for joining us today. And I don't know where I left off, but I was um, wel welcoming everyone. Uh, we want to get started promptly today because we do have um, 12 people who uh, indicated they wanted to provide comments, and um, we also want to leave some time at the end of the session to open the floor. Um, so I just want to pull up one slide just to get things started in terms of um, today's session. What am I sharing? <laughs> um, so uh, just wanted to let you know that we are recording today's session and it will be available so you can go back and take a look at it. Um, we, it will post a, a, on our website at the link there, which Paul will also put in the chat. Um, there's also some background information for this session, including a conversation that we had at the September Wayside Cleanup Advisory Committee. Um, that was a bit of a kickoff um, on this issue. And there's also some information and links there um, that the uh, MassDP Solid Waste Program provided us in terms of uh, uh, active and inactive landfills and some, some information on trends. So I would encourage you, if you're interested to go back and, and review those materials, they'll be informative for this discussion. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, the, and recognize um, the, the DEP listeners who are here today. Um, as I said, I'm Liz Callahan. I'm the Acting Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Wayside Cleanup. Uh, with me is um, Greg Cooper, uh, representing the Solid Waste Program. Greg is the uh, Director of the Business uh, and Business Compliance and Recycling Division. Um, and I also saw uh, John Fisher is here as well. So thank you, John, for joining. And um, also uh, uh, someone you know very well, Paul Locke, who is our acting uh, deputy commissioner for policy and planning. And um, Millie Garcia Serrano is also here. And you all know Millie as the regional director for the Southeast Regional Office, but she's also here today in her capacity as the vice president for ATSWAMO, the Association of State and territorial waste management officials. Um, so thank, thank you all to the DEP staff who are here to listen today. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the Waste Site Cleanup Advisory Committee, committee members um, who participated in that discussion back in September and several of whom are here today. Uh, thank, thank them for their continued um, support in terms of these discussions and, and looking for possible solutions. And a big thank you to the LSP Association. Um, the LSP Association reached out to us and um, volunteered to help identify and reach out to stakeholders to participate in today's discussion. Um, and that was a big help in um, getting this organized and, and making it happen. So thank you to Wendy Rundle, David Leone and their their team for assisting us today. Um, the format for today's session, we're gonna start with comments from um, people who came forward and said they would like to provide comments. Um, we have 12, 12 people on that list and then time permitting at the end, we'll open the floor uh, for other people who are here today to comment. Um, just a note on the chat, I think this is the case that uh, we have closed the chat, but we will open it at the end toward the open session, uh, just because it can be a little bit distracting. 
Um, so with that, I think we can um, start things off and um, I'd like to welcome the first speaker. It's David Leone, um, the president of the LSP Association. Uh, and following and Dave will be uh, John Simpson. Great, uh, thanks Liz, Paul. Um, uh, so as, as Liz mentioned, I'm Dave Leone. Um, I am an LSP and associate principal at GZA in Norwood, um, current president of the LSP Association. Um, LSPA asked MassDEP if we could just start off the meeting with a few brief remarks um, and hopefully kind of set a tone um, to move forward. Uh, first off, LSP extends our thanks to MassDEP for holding this listening session. Uh, we're pleased to see uh, you know, a great diverse group of stakeholders um, that are planning to speak on what is an important and complex issue. Uh, as most of you know, LSP Association is an 800 member association of waste site cleanup professionals, more than half of whom are LSPs. Uh, our members work with institutional, uh, nonprofit, government, and private sector clients to remediate contaminated sites so that these properties can be placed back into active and productive use. And given that uh, the LSPA members work often involves remediation of sites that are slated for development or redevelopment, uh, soil characterization and management is a key component of our work. Uh, to that end, several LSPs and other LSPA members are here to speak today regarding their experiences uh, and their concerns with the management of contaminated soil in the Commonwealth. Um, we at the LSPA regularly hear from our members about their soil management disposal challenges. Uh, some of these include a lack of needed capacity and facilities within the Commonwealth, uh, all but one mass landfill is projected to close by 2030. Um, a lack of capacity of facilities in other New England states uh, and the threat that these facilities might also close. And of course, uh, costs, schedule delays, and the environmental impacts of transporting soil to more distant locations uh, like Midwestern states in Canada. Um, the LSPA is pleased to be operating in a state with forward-looking laws and policies such as our climate policy roadmap, uh, our clean energy and climate plan, the solid waste master plan, and the environmental justice policy. Uh, and in keeping with the principles and objectives that are laid out in these policies, LSP is also cognizant of the importance of managing, disposing of, and creatively reusing our waste in state. Uh, we support identifying and further discussing these possible opportunities. Uh, we understand that the siting and operation of landfills and other facilities is tradition, traditionally um, driven by the private sector, um, and the LSP is appreciative of MassDEP's efforts to consider possible actions that the state um, may take to find possible short-term and long-term approaches uh, for addressing these hurdles uh, and hopefully providing incentives. Uh, in the invitation to this listening session, um, MassDEP asked speakers to specifically address the question do you have any recommendations regarding options, short-term and long-term, for addressing the issue or additional information that you think should be gathered uh, to inform this discussion? LSPA and our members have many suggestions uh, that we think are worth exploring, uh, and we encourage DEP to convene additional opportunities for future stakeholder input and brainstorming on these possibilities. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Uh, and I personally and the rest of the LSPA look forward to hearing what others have to say today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, next up is John Simpson from Charter. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for uh, the invite, Liz. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I took the bullets, got some ideas. I go through my own experience and you know, I think it's basically the uh, last X number of years, and it's been probably, I'd say, about five years since we've, been, since we've all hit this uh, capacity issue um, for disposal of, let's say, more regular installs, you know, it, uh, a crunch the way around. With the, uh, you know, with ARC uh, going down, since the RC and some other facilities that have gone down over the years, that's created a lot of uh, volume that's uh, ended up almost headed to one location, uh, which uh, no fault of their own. Uh, that that capacity, permanent capacity, tends to burn out. John, uh, 
John, yes. uh, could yeah. I interrupt for a second? Sure. Uh, the, your audio is a bit muffled. I don't know, maybe. Yeah, okay. Thank I'm you. Good. Just let me know if you can say more like that. Yeah, so uh, like I was saying, that capacity crunch keeps happening earlier and earlier each year. So that's probably uh, the majority of what I hear uh, on this call uh, today. Um, so, introducing myself, um, you know, uh, John Simpson, Director of uh, Environmental Services for Charter Contractor. Um, Charter started in 1997 when the 97 policy came out. Uh, and the owner, Bob Delholm, realized that. Uh, and while the big dig was being serviced uh, pretty well uh, for volume and disposal, uh, the private sector was not. Uh, and there was a lot of you know, struggling uh, mass excavation contractors. Uh, they were doing uh, building foundations and developers through our Boston and Cambridge. We kind of left them in the dark and stuff. Now what to do with the contaminated the soil. So he started the company to manage that. And it's been going ever since. Um, the, I came on board uh, a couple of years later to take over that part of the company. Well, the, uh, well, he moved on to develop the contracting piece for the remediation side of the company and then onwards uh, to the development side of the company. So there's three parts of the company. Uh, so that was it. Uh, that's the that's kind of the, the snapshot of the company there uh, as, far, as far as what we do. Um, and then, like I said, for myself, I've been doing this for the company about 22 years now. Uh, we basically, you know, my group, environmental services within the company, uh, does about three to four hundred projects a year, um, and then that's for the T and D scopes uh, for third-party management and broker uh, around New England and the tri-state uh, area as well. Um, and then on on top of that, I manage all the uh, charter contracting remediation scopes throughout uh, New England and the tri-state that we do as well. Um, the development side of the company is the company that tends to uh, take over uh, landfill opportunities, uh, like the Hopedale landfill, uh, Amesbury landfill, Chelmsford landfill, and Lynn landfill are the ones that we operate uh, in the past and currently, and have also operated less than RCS1 sites in the, in the past as well. Uh, well, there were a few of them, but now that there's a saturated market in the less than RCS1 sites, um, we're moving on uh, to all the other opportunities, but mainly visit the S1 dumps uh, or S2 dumps later on. Um, so then my experience with the reduction and the, the issues with uh, the soil capacity over the, over the uh, number of years uh, has kind of led to a lot of, uh, when, when we're looking at projects, we tend to look at how can we reduce the volume of the material that's going to go off the site, obviously because of the last six years capacity crunch. Uh, some of the things that we really focus on is uh, really why do we have to get rid of the material? What else can we use it on the job site for? Uh, or if there's a benefit offsite. But the uh, on-site activities, uh, you know, recently and over the years, uh, we're, we moved towards the ISS uh, option. So MGP wastes uh, that will come across large projects that have an MGP component. Uh, we'll, we'll try and put into play an ISS component so we can uh, ISS the material, uh, in situ uh, soil stabilize the material, and then leave it in place as a permanent solution. Uh, we've done that on boat slips uh, where the material, if we pull it out, uh, A, it probably had to go to incineration, uh, and that's costly. Uh, second is that the uh, sheet piling. Uh, would have uh, collapsed and things of that nature. So we come up with these solutions, not only to save the client money, uh, but also you know, to help move the project along and, uh, and, and, and pass over a parcel of land that's useful for the client. Uh, uh, recently, we did 20 or 30,000 yards worth of MGP uh, in the Lynn area, ISS it in place so that the uh, client did not have to export that material, and we continue to look for those type of opportunities. Others are if there's low permeability soil on the job site, uh, such as clay, um, we'll try and find homes for that, uh, reuses for that, whether it's caps and liners, things of that nature. Uh, in the past, we had a project with 500,000 yards worth of uh, Boston Blue clay, uh, which we uh, worked with the owner for that solution. And we're able to get rid of that clay uh, to be reused uh, at just the trucking cost. So that uh, moved the project on uh, really well. 
um, thermally treated options. Um, you know, that's that tends to be uh, what we'll focus on trying to re reduce. Uh, but if we can't reduce it, uh, and that the background concentration for the material is going to be uh, that of backgrounds, or once it's burned, uh, going to be suitable for reuse, uh, then we will recommend a uh, bring back program. So we'll uh, bring it, thermally treat it, and we'll bring it back to the job site if, it, uh, if it's just remediation projects so that they can save on the cost. Uh, and then the disposal option later on does not take up capacity. Uh, others are screening the material. You know, if we've got blocks, uh, granite blocks, and really anything else, uh, we'll recommend screening some of the material, uh, cobbles, anything that can be reused uh, or pulled out uh, to save on weight and disposal going to the landfills. We'll try and tackle that as well, concrete as well for recycling things of that nature. And then if there's any geotechnically suitable material as well, like gravels and sand, so if there's an import uh, option uh, adjacent or somewhere in the air that might need it, that's the other thing that we'll, uh, we'll tackle. So um, let's see here. Schedules, uh, impacts, impacts that we've seen in the past. Um, you know, what we've seen, I'd say in the last three or four years, we've seen a lot of uh, developers and clients hold off on pulling the pro, uh, trigger on projects because of the capacity issue uh, that's the moving with the rear faces. Uh, we've seen projects slide. You know, they'll, they'll try and push a project over to the next year uh, until capacity opens up in the new England area. Uh, we see that happen. Uh, some contractors or developers will limit the depth of the excavation that they go to so that uh, they don't produce as much material. Uh, and then as well as, um, you know, if they do run out of capacity and the, the market uh, pinch, then they'll just stop excavation uh, and they'll stop uh, and they'll just pack up and we'll wait until, uh, you know, until the capacity opens and the flip of the year. So um, those are kind of, I guess, experiences. I apologize, I, 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 you know, having to yell like this is pretty much distracting me, but uh, moving on, uh, I'll try and keep my train of thought. Um, addressing the issues in the future, um, I'd say, you know, one thing that we'll probably, and Paul, you've alluded to this in the past is uh, when does uh, RCS1 material become remediation waste and they can't go to like RCS2 facility because of that? It sounds like that might be on the block for uh, to be revisited, which would be very helpful. Um, and it would probably be also a recommendation if we're going to be revisiting that or opening up discussion on COM 15, uh, which is a fantastic policy, really, really, um, really opened up the market. Uh, so, uh, but it would be nice to revisit that so we can do uh, to get that remediation waste uh, item addressed so that there's more flexibility for material to go to S2 locations. Uh, but also, if we're going to be doing that, I'd highly recommend that we open up a uh, dialogue on Palm 97. Uh, I think that that's, uh, if we're going to do that for 15, might as well do it for 97. And let's see if we can take a look at adjusting the acceptance criteria for some of these facilities uh, to, to take higher concentrations of contaminant levels, which would then take the pressure off of the uh, subtitle Bs and other facilities out of state that also have those capacity constraints. So it gives people flexibility. Uh, the other one is also the treated soils. Treated soils usually come down to go to line landfills in Massachusetts. Probably a good one to revisit if we can't uh, bring those into the unlined facility. It's kind of an interesting scenario in which the S2 dumps uh, in some cases, mass wise, uh, can take higher concentrations than online landfills, you know, if you do some of the details. Uh, so it'd be nice to, to throw them all on the table and be able to uh, discuss those and adjust those permits and acceptance criteria at the same time, if possible. Um, those are kind of my thoughts. Um, again, I apologize for, for um, the speaker being being a problem, but any other questions, I'll kind of leave it at that and uh, and I look forward to any questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. 
Uh, next up is Susan Rook from DCAM, and on deck is Jason Barrasso. And uh, Liz and Paul, if I could ask one of you to also unmute James Matz, he's going to be making part of DCAM's comments to the group. Um, I'm just going to give um, a very brief set of comments and then turn it over to James for uh, the more technical comments. But we do want to thank and applaud MassDP for hosting this session and engaging in this very important topic that affects projects large and small uh, by municipalities, by state agencies, state authorities, as well as the private market. The importance of trying to examine the marketplace and obstacles um, to success for projects is critical, I think, across the Commonwealth. So, we're very pleased to uh, be sitting in on this and, and listening to the, the ideas um, from others that are in different positions within the marketplace. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to James Matz, who is um, with DCAM and is an LSP. James. Thank you, Susan. Uh, let me put on my video here so we can see my face. There we are. Good morning, everyone. So a couple of things that uh, we want to uh, provide input on based on our experience with our uh, current projects, uh, both from soil management and also just as importantly for us, demolition debris. So with regards to soil, we work on projects that uh, sediment dredging or ecological restoration projects. There appear to be very few facilities uh, that are available across New England uh, to accept sediment, dredging spoils. Uh, primarily, we've only been able to rely on one facility, and that's the one in Vermont. And so I believe that, you know, previously, um, the uh, landfill um, in uh, Worcester accepted sediment and dredge spoils. Uh, we, we all know that that's long since uh, been closed to that opportunity. So again, I think as, as John is certainly alluded to and, and David did at the beginning is really what I think that we're hoping for uh, either in the consulting or the uh, developer or the project donor aspect is greater flexibility. It becomes quite a challenge uh, to manage the schedule and, and the, um, and the uh, budget of our uh, projects because frankly, the waste management aspect seems to be very schedule um, li limited. So uh, there are a number of projects right now that DCAM is involved in uh, for demolition and renovation, a number of raise and rebuild projects we're working on. Now it's of course easy enough to say that we can strip away the ABC materials and the steel uh, and the glass and send those off to the appropriate recycling facilities. Uh, DCAM takes great pride in maximizing our recycling opportunities. However, there is still a significant piece of demolition debris. And what we're finding is, is that there's the waste management facility, which is closed for the season, and we're shipping our demo debris out of state uh, for additional cost time and additional cost to the taxpayer. It doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense to us. Um, and of course, with the demolition debris also comes the ACM waste. And again, we have one facility in New England that can take that most of the time. So um, I know that that would be a, a controversial topic in all the states um, about in, uh, finding another opportunity for a facility. But uh, from our aspect, uh, we are looking at not just the, the remediation waste, but what we're seeing significant impact on is sediment, uh, dredge spoils, and really for us, the uh, greater opportunity or flexibility for facilities that can accept our demo debris. Thank you, Susan. Anything there? No, thank you, James. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Susan and James. Okay, thank you. And thank you for waiting 30 minutes before we mentioned uh, ACM material. Uh, <laughs> next, uh, Jason Barrasso, if you can unmute, uh, you're up. And after Jason will be Carrie Tell. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, 
My name is Jason Barroso. I'm with Waste Management. I um, wanted to thank uh, the LSPA and DEP for uh, putting this listening session together, and thank you um, all for allowing us to speak. Um, I want to provide a perspective. There's, there's varied stakeholders on um, the speaking list, um, some of which have a much broader view of the industry uh, than I do. I do have a consulting background for about 15 years uh, on the LSP track. Um, but right now, what I, what I do is I'm the senior industrial account manager uh, for waste management, and I handle material coming out of Massachusetts heading to various waste management facilities. Uh, anything generated in Massachusetts that is not uh, solid waste, which I refer to as MSW, or clean C&D materials um, would end up going through my group. Um, so waste management operates landfills, transfer stations, and most people are familiar with, you know, the big green dumpsters and the big green trucks, but uh, uh, the largest portion of our business is actually um, end use facilities uh, like landfills. Um, operating in Massachusetts and the soil disposal world, there's a number of different facilities, um, and I'm not sure everyone has a good understanding of what a subtitle D landfill, what the challenges a subtitle D landfill deals with versus a landfill capping project at an online landfill facility or a um, quarry fill for less than RCS1 or less than RCS2 soil. So I'm gonna try and um, elaborate on the challenges that we're dealing with. Um, so just to go over our facilities, uh, we have turnkey recycling environmental enterprise which folks refer to as turnkey landfill up in Rochester, New Hampshire. It's a RECRA subtitle D facility um, and it accepts, it's permitted to accept 1 million cubic yards of material annually. It's generally been a 50-50 a split of municipal solid waste and C&D versus non-HAS waste. Um, Approximately 325,000 tons of non has waste per year comes out of Massachusetts into that one facility. Um, this would include soil, asbestos debris, asbestos soil, uh, sludge materials, PCB bulk product wastes, a whirlwind of industrial byproducts. Um, but another thing that folks probably don't realize is about 15% of that capacity by weight is recycling residuals that go for beneficial reuse. So that's gonna be metal shredder residues, C and D residuals. So the waste that comes after we recycle accounts for 15% of that, uh, that million cubic yards. It's, it's a big number. Um, the more we recycle, the more that number goes up. Um, it, it's, it's, it's inevitable. There's, you can't recycle 100% of everything and it needs somewhere to go. Um, our next, uh, closest facility that we used to go to um, out of state was Crossroads Landfill in Norwich Rock, Maine. Uh, they historically would accept 300,000 cubic yards or could accept 300,000 cubic yards of material annually. Um, previous years, with the exception of 2020 and 2021, um, Crossroads would accept 100,000 tons of non-HAS waste from Massachusetts. So we're up to 425,000 tons of non-HAS waste from Massachusetts that's going outside of Massachusetts for direct landfill, uh, not including, you know, not including beneficial use. Uh, materials there, same thing, soil, asbestos debris, sludge, and a wide range of uh, industrial byproducts, uh, but primarily crossroads would be soil, sludge, and asbestos. Um, in 2020 and 2021, it was a um, I, it, fiber right was a facility up in Maine, uh, which I believe was, I think they call it a dirty MRF where they're, they're going to have active sorting of solid waste to pull the recyclables out. Well, that facility closed, uh, it failed and closed in 2020. Um, so our volume went from hundred thousand tons at crossroads to 30,000 tons is all we could accept. This year, crossroads stopped accepting material from out of state in August because we, we're gonna exceed our permitted uh, volume. Um, 2020, Massachusetts didn't notice because we had COVID shutdowns and our construction schedules got interrupted for you know, a couple months, which allowed 
turnkey to continue operating through almost making it through the entire year. Um, we didn't have that same scenario this year. So turnkey ended up um, shutting down to out of state waste uh, in September this year. Um, we currently operate the Fitchburg Westminster landfill in Massachusetts, which is also a record subtitle D facility. It's permitted to accept MSW and non-has wastes. I believe it's permitted for 500,000 tons annually. Um, the, while we're permitted to accept non-hazardous wastes, uh, we generally don't have capacity to do so because of the amount of volume of MSW from within the state that gets pushed there. Um, so uh, as far as daily cover or beneficial reuse, uh, we would historically be accepting 80 to 100,000 tons of material there. Uh, that would be a roughly 50-50 mix of COM 97 soils and recycling residuals. Again, metal shredder residue, um, C and D residuals, glass, glass, ash, foundry sands, sometimes water treatment residuals. You know, folks would get a beneficial use determination for a number of different waste streams. Um, the past in 2021, we had to uh, limit COM 97 soils down to about 30,000 tons versus um, previous years of about 50,000 tons. So, and this is primarily due to an increase, um, primarily due to, to limiting volume into the facility to preserve life. Um, so uh, the facility is permitted through 2024 um, and we've been having a reduced volume intake there so that it will last until 2024. Um, we're currently trying to get an expansion permitted there. Um, we may or may not get that expansion approved. If that expansion doesn't get approved, Fitchburg will be closing in 2024. Um, as far as capacity reduction over the past couple of years, we had the Taunton and Chicopee landfills uh, both closed. Uh, Taunton closed in 2020. Um, historically, it would accept 80,000 tons of beneficial reuse material, so roughly 40,000 tons of soil and 40,000 tons of recycling residuals. Uh, Chicopee closed in 2019, same thing, roughly 80,000 tons of beneficial reuse that's been taken off the out of the market, roughly 40,000 tons of soil annually and 40,000 tons of recycling residuals. Um, these materials are still being produced, we just don't have anywhere to bring them um, locally. Um, there's been other capacity reductions in the marketplace, which I'll let, I'm sure other folks will speak to as well, but, you know, South Casella Southbridge landfill, I'm sure Scott Sampson will speak to that, um, later on in the, in the listening session. And then, um, the ARC and CPRC issue up in Maine, the Maine DEP implemented new regulations, uh, that required additional, um, substantially, well, how do I say this? required additional information when permitting. And, and one of the major changes with the DEP regulations for the soil recycling facilities was that they account for the end use of their recycled soil. And both facilities did not renew their permit once the new regulations came into effect. Um, so that's, I'll, I'll let some of the other folks comment on capacity um, that those uh, facilities would accept. Um, we're seeing, we're seeing a regulatory climate that presents a lot of headwinds on the subtitle D, uh, front. Um, again, we're accepting solid waste, we're accepting C and D residuals, soil, it's a mix of everything. So as C and D residuals, you know, C and D residuals continue increasing and so does soil, we can only fit so much in that 10 pound bag, um, we're seeing trends across, across the region of states valuing a public benefit before they allow for permanent expansions. So what does that mean? It basically means that states are starting to evaluate when we're asking for an expansion, they're starting to evaluate, well, if we issue this expansion, what's the benefit to the host community? What's the benefits to the host county? What's the benefit to the host state? Um, it's concerning uh, because that kind of focus is, is, could lead to some scary places, such as volume control. We have a landfill in New York that never comes into play, and most people on this call probably haven't heard of it, because part of their permit requires that 50% of material 
that goes into that landfill come from the host county or the contiguous counties. So you're only going to get so much. It's, it's, near, it's in Saratoga County. You can only take in 50% of the material can, has to come from Saratoga County or another county that touches Saratoga County. So it severely limits what you can bring from out of state into that facility. And therefore that facility is not really a player in the soil market uh, for Massachusetts, especially for, for disposal or asbestos, because you're, you've, got a lot, you've got a lot of locations closer to that to fill in the available capacity based on the host county. Um, so it's, it's a little, um, I mean, I, I, we are certainly at a, at a, a, a critical time as far as landfill capacity uh, goes. Um, another thing to point out is there have been some uh, recent regulatory responses to these issues. Um, New Hampshire DES has um, told us that they will be giving us quarterly restrictions at Turnkey. So we're no longer going to be given a million cubic yards per year and fill it up as you see fit. They're now going to tell us how much we can bring in per quarter. Um, that's as far as they've gone so far. Uh, Maine DEP already has a $5 per ton. Um, they call it a special waste fee. It's, it's different than what Massachusetts refers to as special waste in the regulations, but basically it's non-hazardous waste. There's a $5 per ton fee on any um, out-of-state um, non-hazardous waste that goes in there. And as of January 1st, they're implementing a $10 per ton biosolids fee. Um, which hasn't been finalized, but will be retroactive to January 1st. So while I can't tell you who's going to pay it and how it gets collected, they are going to be collecting $10 per ton for any biosolids that go to Maine. Um, so, uh, you know, 2022 and beyond what's on the horizon, um, regional capacity in New England and New York is certainly coming up short. We're we're seeing about, we have about 70% the capacity, capacity to demand, basically. So, you know, demand far outweighs, you know, our capacity to accept the material. This isn't just New England. Um, this is extending to Pennsylvania. Central New York landfills are also overfilled. Um, we expect Western New York. We have a high acres facility that some of the folks on this call have been shipping material to in the last quarter here for jobs to just keep working. We're expecting Western New York to start having capacity issues in 2020 and start bouncing off of their uh, annual capacity limits. Um, like I mentioned earlier, Maine's had some uh, struggles in state uh, with material. And so they're no, they're no longer gonna be the backup to turnkey. It's no longer gonna be go to New Hampshire or go to Maine. It's gonna be go to New Hampshire and if New Hampshire fills up for the quarter and can't take it, you're going to be you're going to have to ship that material out to Fairport, New York, if you want it to stay in a waste management um, in the waste management network. Um, our backlog continues to grow. It's not like you know we stopped receiving material in September, but it's not like folks stopped asking for prices or or or, uh, or stopped planning projects. Um, but now we can't play catch up at the beginning of the year and bring these projects up to speed. We're going to have quarterly capacity limits. So we're no longer going to be able to open the floodgates and let projects come in and catch up and start getting up to speed. Um, it's, 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 it's going to present a lot of challenges uh, for me, obviously coming into 22, but for it's going to present a lot of challenges in 2022 for a lot of folks. Um, there was a question as to how um, our organization, you know, general question to the speakers, how your organization um, is re responding to these uh, issues. Um, and we're going to have to take on a much, uh, much, much more active management role in what materials we accept at our facilities. Uh, in 2020, we had 325 profiled, uh, profiles for waste to be accepted. Um, this is Massachusetts alone. We had 325 profiles at turnkey. And if I had taken the 75 biggest profiles, we would have met our annual capacity. So it's almost, that's 250 profiles that we shouldn't even looked at because we don't have the capacity for it. And those are generally the smaller, uh, smaller jobs. 
Um, so in 2022, we have to be, we waste management have to be much more selective about what opportunities we're going to be taking um, at our landfills, just because we don't have the ability to meet the demand. Um, we're going to be act actively coordinating our project schedules with our customers with monthly volume restrictions for them. And we're going to have weekly, you know, some of our major customers that are going in, you know, every single day with multiple projects. I, I'm going to be having to have weekly meetings with them, updating what they anticipate for capacity. Um, and obviously it, it, it's going to end up, you know, there's a lot more effort. It's, it's going to end up with substantial price increases um, to one, try and turn uh, certain types of projects away. Um, and, and two, just because we're, it's, it's a supply demand issue. Um, so we're, I'm not particularly looking forward to 2022. Um, as far as recommendations, uh, remember, I'm looking at this from the I'm looking at this industry as far as material that doesn't meet less than RCS1, doesn't meet less than RCS2, doesn't meet unlined landfill capping projects. Um, so in my world, I honestly think that Massachusetts needs in-state subtitle D facilities. Um, the only reason I'm seeing material in New Hampshire and Maine and New York is because there's nowhere for it to go in Massachusetts. And a lot of times that's because it's chemically unsuitable, physically unsuitable, and needs to be direct landfilled instead of beneficially reused. Um, and the other part of the equation is that you've got a volume of material that was beneficial reuse in state. As these landfills continue to close, that volume doesn't shrink. There's just nowhere else to take it. So um, you know, as you limit, as, as we limit the number of landfills, we're also limiting the locations where we can send C and D residuals in COM 97 soils. Um, so it's, that's, that's a, a, to me, I think Massachusetts either needs new subtitle D facilities or needs to be prepared for the impacts of trying to drive two days in a truck to take one load of material, because that's what it, it's a, it's a two-day drive out to Fairport, New York, and some of the Western New York facilities that still have a little bit of capacity. And then where are we going after that? So I apologize. I didn't have uh, better news from our perspective, but it is, uh, it's is—it's been a, a drastic change. In the past few years, we lost about 80,000 tons of beneficial reuse capacity in state, and we lost about 70,000 tons of non-hazardous disposal capacity out of state. And uh, that's all I had for my converse, for my uh, conversation. Oh, uh, well, thank you, Jason. Uh, maybe we should have had you last. Boy. <laughs> um, uh, those are sobering uh, statistics. Uh, but thank you very much for, for putting all of this in, in perspective. Uh, Carrie Tell, uh, you're up next. Uh, and then after Carrie... Uh, I lost my list. After Carrie, Kate Delawari. After Carrie is Kate. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Liz and Paul, for this opportunity. And thanks to Dave Leon and Wendy Rundle for pushing this forward. Cooperstown has clients developing several sites in Roxbury. These brownfield sites have varying levels of contamination that require removal for both environmental reasons and simply to make room for foundations. Without the ready availability of soil disposal options, the prices for this component of the development may endanger the project. There is an environmental justice component to this as well. This growing challenge as these much needed developments for both residential and job creating businesses may be thwarted. These neighborhoods need these brownfield sites to be returned to productive use for living and working environment. The LSP community knows this is as much a solid waste issue as it is a DEP concern. However, the LSP's appeal is that the departments consider this challenge in a collaborative manner. And it, 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 my, my plea is short and sweet, but that the, um, the types of soils and the ready availability uh, for solid waste solutions for these folks is starting to create a conversation among developers who want to come in 
and work on areas that we're all painfully aware of that do need um, uh, full development. And that's it for me. Okay, thank you. Carrie, uh, Kate, you're up. Um, you can unmute. Great. And, at, oh, oh, and after Kate is Brian Dexter. Go ahead, Kate. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Kate Delawari. I'm a licensed site professional and a principal consultant at Haley and Aldrich. And I appreciate MassDEP's willingness to engage in this conversation today and LSPA's support in communicating with DEP on these challenges. Uh, Haley and Aldrich provides environmental consulting services for public, private, and institutional property owners who remediate and redevelop contaminated properties. My colleagues and I assist our clients with planning uh, for disposal of hundreds of thousands of tons of soil annually. I have about 22 years of experience doing this. I have direct experience with the reduction in soil capacity in recent years, um, echoing what many others have, have touched upon. In practice, there are really only a few lined and unlined in-state landfills that are still accepting soils uh, for daily cover. Uh, these facilities have limitations on how much soil they can accept on a daily basis and in certain seasons. And uh, as others have pointed out, within less than 10 years, most of these landfills are planned to be closed. Uh, the Massachusetts landfills generally do not accept soils, which have been treated to stabilize TCLP lead. This can often be a fairly significant component of the contaminated soil at many urban sites. TCLP treated soil gets diverted to out of state RECRA subtitle D landfills as a result. Those facilities, as others have highlighted, are already experiencing capacity issues. Uh, we also have no disposal options in state for asbestos contaminated soil. Sorry for mentioning that, Paul. Uh, which also gets diverted to subtitle D facilities. Uh, you know, just echoing everybody's comments, the regional subtitle D facilities, Turnkey in Rochester, New Hampshire, and Crossroads in Norwich Walk, Maine, frequently reach their annual capacities in the second half of the year, providing no outlet within driving distance for projects in Massachusetts. And also options for petroleum contaminated soil recycling at asphalt batch facilities are scarce. Aggregate Industries in Stoughton closed years ago. Aggregate Recycling Corporation in Elliott, Maine stopped re receiving soil in the past couple of years. The Andrix facility in Chicopee is one of the few remaining options nearby for petroleum contaminated soils. So let me give some specific project examples where these factors have caused impacts. I have a client who's planning a large scale development project which will need to generate over 100,000 tons of soil requiring disposal at a RECRA subtitle D facility over the next one to two years. In the absence of capacity issues, the soil would mostly go to turnkey landfill in New Hampshire. There's no Massachusetts landfill that is permitted to accept this material. Because of the risk of turnkey not being open when we need it and the large quantity that we'll be generating, we have been in proactive discussions with the landfills to find a home for the soil. Because of the landfill capacity limitations, Turnkey can only commit to accepting a fraction of the soil that we'll be generating. We will be forced to transport a large component of the soils to landfills much farther away in Maine and upstate New York. The farther away the landfill, the higher the transportation costs, the greater the carbon emissions, and the more drivers and trucks we need to make longer round trips to achieve the same soil removal rate from the construction site. We can only hope that uh, truck driver shortages won't further exacerbate the issues. The single project will likely incur a premium cost of six to seven million dollars just to truck the soil farther away. It's also likely to extend the construction duration for soil removal by several months due to the reduced daily rate that the soil can be received at those out-of-state landfills. Another example is a large development project in Cambridge, which involves construction of underground parking below an apartment building. The urban fill in this general neighborhood, it's not unique to this particular property, contains more than a trace amount of ash. While the majority of the soil at this site is, meets COM 97 chemical criteria for reuse as daily cover, the Massachusetts landfills will not take much of the soil due, the, due to the elevated ash content or because it needed to be TCLP treated prior to excavation. A large amount of the soil, which otherwise contained relatively low levels of typical urban fill contaminants, needed to be hauled out of state. The project incurred a premium cost of close to a million dollars. 
um, above the cost to have managed the soil at in-state landfills. This is a multifamily residential redevelopment project. The original owner sold the project to a new developer after we advised them of the soil management costs, which made their margins infeasible. Speaking of multifamily redevelopment, we need more affordable housing in Massachusetts, particularly in urban and transit oriented neighborhoods. I recently asked a client of mine who's a multifamily developer why he was no longer pursuing urban sites. He's been pushed out to sites in suburban communities. He told me that he can't make the margins work anymore when he needs underground parking. Among other pressures, soil disposal costs are high and brownfield tax credits are no longer reliable or available, especially for sites with contaminated historic fill. So how are, we, how are our projects responding to all of these pressures? Um, you know, redevelopment projects must displace soil. There's, there's no choice. On urban sites, it's not an option to regrade the soil on site. Brownfield redevelopment relies on affordable options for disposal of contaminated soil. My clients constructing affordable and market rate housing are moving to, moving to suburban sites. Typically only real estate, which can command much higher rent, such as life sciences buildings and luxury apartment uh, buildings are being built on brownfield sites. We've had to delay project starts into the first half of the year since capacity is less at the end of the year. We've had soil excavation take much longer than planned due to disposal capacity limitations. We're looking at rail transport of soil because we're running out of options within driving distance. Except for projects which can take advantage of a private rail siding, the closest transfer facilities um, in many, or, you know, for many urban areas are an hour plus away. It would be helpful to have a rail transfer facility in the Boston area, but e even if there were, based on the quotes we've received, rail transport would still nearly double the cost for soil disposal. We're looking at sending soil from the Boston area to upstate New York, Ohio, Alabama, and Virginia. This can't be the most sustainable solution. To mitigate the risk of having nowhere to bring our soil, we're also looking at projects entering into contracts with landfills to lock in space in advance. This can work for projects with big pockets, but it's likely to exacerbate the situation for smaller generators since the only players, since only the biggest players have the means to reserve in advance the available landfill space. All these factors are exacerbating issues of affordability, equity, and sustainability. While life sciences real estate might be able to afford the steep prices to redevelop in the urban core, these factors will prevent brown, brownfield rehabilitation in other communities in Massachusetts where it's most needed. I do have one recommendation for a solution that could increase capacity, um, which is allowing for COM 97 soils to be reused at other contaminated sites. This is an untapped opportunity that's currently prohibited by the remediation waste management provisions of the Massachusetts Contingency Plan, except by specific MassDEP approval. I know of many large scale redevelopment projects which are designing sites for a raise in grade to address sea level rise and resiliency issues. Some of these sites are former oil terminals, rail yards, et cetera. They are not pristine. We could beneficially reuse other urban fill soils and then cap these sites with clean soil and pavement cover with an activity and use limitation. There would be no significant risk for future site use. It would be wonderful if MassDEP could model the success of the ACO approach for uncontaminated soils and provide a similar path for COM 97 soils. And that's the end of my comments. Thank you, Kate. All right, thank you. Uh, Brian Dexter is up next, and then Jennifer Griffith. Yes, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes. yes. All right, very good. So yeah, a lot of interesting information here this morning. Um, I want to start off by saying on behalf of Onric Materials and Recycling, um, you know, we thank Mass DEP and the LSBA for organizing this listening session, as well as those who are offering comments and feedback to further address it. So. Again, my name is Brian Dexter. I've been involved with soil management in one regard or another for the last 20 something years. Uh, I'm the environmental account manager for Onric Materials and Recycling located in Chicopee, Massachusetts. Permitted in 1992, now Onric is the last operating cold mix asphalt batching facility in the state of Massachusetts that takes a fair amount of volume or a relevant amount of volume. 
We recycle soils by treating chemical contaminants and enhancing physical attributes to create a post-process material that can be reused in certain applications in mass and other states. So our connection to this topic is we are an in-state facility. Um, we service a wide array of generators, uh, consultants, institutions, municipalities, redevelopment companies, remedial contractors all throughout the state. So as a result of that, we accept petroleum containment soils from MCP sites, AST, UST tank work, remediation and redevelopment projects. To give you an idea of scale, we take on average around 125,000 plus tons annually. Uh, 2021, we've taken more. Um, the reduction of soil disposal capacity over the last couple of years has affected us in a variety of ways. Um, we have seen significantly more volume over a larger geographic footprint from projects that at one time would have had multiple options uh, to address their needs. Uh, we're seeing bottlenecks um, due to operational throughput as well as administrative congestion uh, for, for our facility, but we were experiencing that with the other facilities that we work with as well and some of um, folks within the industry. Um, as other soil receiving facilities restrict their volume, shut down for the year, or close permanently, we get inundated with another surge of requests. Additionally, Ondrix retains a synergistic relationship for our post-process recycled soil in Mass and in other states. Some of these partners were at one time mass and state landfills, which used our materials as an alternative to other sources, oftentimes virgin materials for construction maintenance projects within these systems. Many of the in-state landfills we work with are no longer in operation, and the few facilities still in active operation have limited lifespan. As a result, we have fewer options for our post-process materials and need to seek alternative options so balancing these competing tensions impacts the volume of contaminated soils we can accept for recycling on an annual basis. So how we responded to this capacity issue. So as a facility, um, we responded by limiting the volume of material our customers can bring in and raising our recycling rates and having to work our clients into very restrictive schedules at certain times of the year from operational throughput and also due to weather and other forces, but generally speaking, it's because of an onslaught and surge of volume. Additionally, we need to refocus critical resources to evaluate alternative means and measures for our post-process materials in order to keep operating. So some of the consequences we've observed from the reduced soil capacity, um, I'm gonna to speak to this for us and also some of our customers because we feel that side of it as well. So generally project costs and budgets are becoming unfavorable to the extent that work is not being completed, sites may remain in limbo, remedial activities are not completed and the time frame is needed. Some projects are dying on the vine or passed up altogether. And I feel like we are on the cusp of seeing T&D rates coming to a pivot point that will slow or possibly halt development in certain areas. This is exacerbated by the economic uncertainty due to the pandemic and other factors in our urban centers. Uh, we're seeing soils being approved, but are unable to were unable to receive them at our facility. The higher tipping fees in general across the board, so that's not just us, but that's gonna to apply to all facilities as well as the record levels of inflation, exacerbating this further. Um, we're experiencing new expenses um, as a result of seeking alternative options for our post-process materials. This is also gonna be passed on to the smart drive. Additionally, more increases are made for non-conforming or ill-fitting materials due to the general lack of industry disposal options. I think that any, any of the other facilities would agree they're getting more and more looks at stuff that isn't a great fit. Um, and then generally the generators of contaminated soil are becoming increasingly dependent upon uncertain out of state or out of New England facilities to dispose of soils and ensure MCP compliance as a lack of the, the op options within the state. So again, this leads to the larger carbon footprint, which obviously could jeopardize some of the 2050 net zero initiatives and the dependency on other states and their infrastructure is not something that we see as sustainable. Um, with regard to some of the recommendations, you know, I'd like to start off by reiterating the following here. Um, Onric Materials and Recycling is, is really encouraged to see this level of candor and commitment from MassDEP and appreciates the LSPA's involvement with this. We agree that the DEP and facilities should work together to develop management alternatives for contaminated soils that can provide safe, reliable outlets for cleanup, redevelopment, and remediation projects, while also providing protection for public safety, health, and the environment. 
In recent years, we have evaluated opportunities for material reuse that are supported by risk-based technical assessments. But these initiatives get lost in a quagmire of competing regulatory provisions. Operationally, we are subject to the solid waste regulations, the Massachusetts Contingency Plan, and the hazardous waste program regulations for permitting recycling facilities. This overlapping regulatory structure adds several layers for us to consider to seek solutions for alternative reuses for our recycled materials, which we can or could generate as a result of our permit process. There is also the industry-wide issue of lower level remediation waste and how these soils are currently managed. And again, I'm speaking to multiple facilities with regard to that. Additionally, in the recently released 2030 Solid Waste Master Plan, DEP identifies the need to assess management alternatives within the solid waste management system for non-MSW materials, including ash, sludges, and contaminated soils. We believe that an in-depth review and assessment as stated in this plan would result in a more pragmatic regulatory scheme that is integrated and complementary across the various regimes that have authority over the fate of the contaminated soils in the Commonwealth. Our objective is to continue to accept soils while creating sustainable recycled products in compliance with the regulatory framework. We're also interested in exploring opportunities to expand the market for our post-process materials so our business is not tethered to a shrinking landfill capacity in mass, which ultimately affects our potential to service the industry. With creative approach and regulatory collaboration, we feel we have the ability to provide more significant soil recycling capacity in addition to more recycled product options to promote a robust and state solution to aid in the complex soil issues we are faced with in Massachusetts. Um, again, thank you all for your time. We're anxious to learn more and hear more about this session. Thank you, Brian. Welcome, thank you. Thank you. Next up is Jennifer Griffith, Griffiths from Numoa. And following Jennifer will be uh, Bill French. Great. Well, hi, everybody. My name is Jennifer Griffith. I work at NAMOA, which some of you know and some of you don't. So I'll tell you what it is. We're the Northeast Waste Management Officials Association. We were formed by the governors back in the 1980s to uh, the governors of the six New England states to focus on um, solid waste, hazardous waste. Waste site cleanup programs belong to NAMOA and also toxic use reduction and pollution prevention type of programs belong to NAMOA. And subsequently to our forming, uh, New York and New Jersey also joined. <clears throat> so NAMOA's members are the state um, regulatory programs and we have had a focus um, at the request of the states and the NAMOA directors, um, a focus on sort of this mildly contaminated soil for over 10 years now. Um, and we also, we got together the solid waste program staff and the waste site cleanup program staff within each state. So uh, in the work group uh, to try to increase communication because everybody's aware there might be, you know, the same soil if it's generated at a, at a waste site cleanup site, um, maybe it's subject to different regulations than something that, um, and standards than something that's generated at a regular construction site. So the solid waste and the hazardous waste and the waste site cleanup programs, um, we've been meeting for many years. Um, in the beginning, we had a dream of trying to sort of develop a regional soil program and have sort of the similar approach and, and numbers in each state. Um, and we sort of had to give up on that. <laughs> um, every state is, is different and we're, um, but we're continuing to meet so that everybody is sharing information and trying to be aware of the issues. Uh, soil, this mildly contaminated soil seems to uh, become politically uh, highlighted you know, in different states at different times, but generally um, this capacity issue is really bringing it to the fore. Recently, uh, NAMOA has developed a um, disposal capacity report that we published um, last year. I can put the link in the chat that's interesting um, and just highlights what people have been saying that things are closing, things are um, likely to close short soon and we're going to have even more struggles with where um, waste can go and that is creating tension um, 
you know, the big states are having more capacity issues and the smaller states tend to, um, tend to see the effects of that. So um, there's definitely um, discussions going on. So Namoa also wanted the states wanted to try to be a little more transparent and, and put information about contaminated soil management um, together. So we did develop a, a website, a web page on our website that's called the State Information Resource on uh, Soil Reuse. So we tried to put um, you know, sort of relevant information from each state. And that is, I try to get the states to look at that. Um, changes were made not too long ago to update information. So it's not guaranteed to be totally up to date, but it's, it's uh, a work in progress. Um, and I will also put the link to that information resource. So uh, I think states can learn from each other. Uh, Massachusetts approach, um, believe it or not, you know, has has eased some tensions and some states are looking at to that as a as a model. Um, so we'll see. Um, I don't know if I have anything else to say, but I think um, if anybody has any questions later and I will share links to those documents uh, in a minute. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Uh, next up is Bill French, and after Bill will be Ross Hartman. Uh, good morning. Um, I would also like to thank uh, MassDEP and the LSPA for hosting this morning. Um, obviously, um, uh, it's, a, it's a, a matter that needs discussion. So again, I, I do appreciate it. Um, I'm the owner of WL French Excavating. We're a um, union site contractor and soil manage management firm from Delrica, Mass., uh, in 2022, we'll be celebrating our 50th year in business. Um, we currently operate two ACO sites in the state and one online landfill, which is the Winchenden landfill. Um, and I think ourselves and, and a couple others in the area are really known for moving uh, the larger volumes of, of waste uh, throughout the New England area. Um, I think that if you really look at the, the reduction that is problematic today, and not to say that there aren't problems coming down the line because there are, and I'll mention that briefly in a moment, but as Jason was describing, the out-of-state subtitle B uh, issue that we're currently uh, you know, in, in, in the midst of, um, it, it's been going on for several years, and quite frankly, uh, it worked out in years pre, uh, prior that you know, if turnkeys slowed down for a certain amount of time or or came up short, whether it be June one year, which was horrible, or September, uh, like it was this season. There were other alternatives within our region, such as Waste USA in Vermont and or um, North Country in Bethlehem, um, Norwalk, uh, Maine Crossroads. Those were all still available. So we were kind of able to divert some of the materials. Uh, th there, was a, there was a cost impact, but it wasn't anything like we're seeing right now. It seems like we're in the perfect storm this season. Um, Norwalk shut down in um, August of this year, so even before Turnkey. Um, Waste USA was experiencing uh, cell construction, so that they were limited to um, just taking, I, I believe, what, what they had on the contract and their, their own, uh, to sell his own work. And uh, North, North Country in, in Bethlehem um, was at a, a, a substantially reduced volume. So, you know, here we are, we're faced with moving all this soil, my company is, other companies like us, and we have no disposal options. So, um, you know, you look at that and then you also have to take into consideration that, you know, we used to have ARC, CPRC and aggregate for our asphalt batching options. And now we're down to Andrick, which Brian mentioned earlier, we have uh, a, a very minute amount of space uh, available to us. So. You know, the, the disposal market is, is, you know, our options currently are limited space at some local facilities like Andrick or uh, we're shipping to uh, various facilities in New York and one in Ohio. Um, so the reduction is, is it's just blatantly obvious to, to everybody on the phone, but for us, it's like stifling. We, you know, we went from 140 trucks a day down to 
to 70 at one point. And, you know, now we're kind of bouncing back and forth. Um, how the, 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 uh, the consequences of the reduced capacity, um, like I'm saying, it, it, it's, it's the schedule impacts for the jobs that, that just flat out stop. Um, some of the owners uh, were able to, to reach in and, and get more funding or had more money to, to um, pay the, uh, the upcharges, which were significant to go to New York or Ohio. And they're lucky to, to uh, you know, be able to do that. But that being said, um, they're still going to in, be impacted schedule uh, schedule wise with project delays because the volume that we were moving on one job was like fifteen hundred to two thousand tons a day, and now it's down to how many trucks we can get to go to New York. One day it's eight, the next day it's fifteen. So the, the impacts are, are across the board. Um, some of the other impacts that that uh, that the reduced capacity is is having is on some of our uh, municipal contracts, um, line items like uh, uh, um, scum and residual from wastewater plants, uh, catch basin sediments that are impacted with uh, storage. Um, we've, we've had to tell a couple, a couple of host communities and even the city that we're not able to fulfill contractual obligations right now because the facilities can't take the material. And that those are the local facilities, not the New York or Ohio. So, you know, um, we've seen developers completely stop. And again, we've seen some developers and in, in entities that were able to push forward. But regardless of, of what's happened, the, the jobs are either stopped or, uh, you know, the, the schedule is getting impacted substantially. Um, so, you know, the other items that we look at or I look at is, okay, so we have this subtitle D problem that's staring us in the face, but where are we going to be? in 12 to 18 months when the four online landfills that are operating today are either closed or have minimum capacity as well. So, you, you know, that would be a worse situation than we're actually in today because now, would, you know, what do you do with the online sales? As we all know, the line market is down to, it, it's, it's minimized beyond what I've ever seen capacity at. And now, there's a, a, a distinct possibility that Fitchburg won't get their permit and we will have no real line space to, stay, to speak of. Some of the line landfills in the area are, are using other, uh, other waste streams as cover. So as you know, they might be out there, but they're not necessarily using soil. And if they are using soil, it's, it's a, a, a real uh, small capacity or frequency uh, depending on what they need and when they need it. Um, you know, uh, when you talk about some of the recommendations, I think John Simpson hit on one earlier that would be a, a large help. And I think it'd have to be obviously specific to each facility, but allowing RCS two sites to accept uh, remediation waste as long as, as it meets the uh, site specific chemical criteria, I think that would be a big, a big help to the market. Um, again, it's not the magic bullet because if these online landfills all come offline at the same time, we're gonna have a major problem. Um, Another thing that that would make sense to me is perhaps looking at some of the um, the, the landfill regulation the, the regulations as they pertain to landfill expansion. Um, what could be done to either relax those in, in, in site specific situations? Not you know obviously there's some landfills that won't work, but you know if we do have site assigned landfills out there and they have more capacity, then what we've seen. Uh, or what they've been given uh, in, a, in a closure type uh, situation, I mean, now's the time to really look at those expansions if, if there's the space in the host community, community are, are willing to listen. Um, that would be a big one in, in my um, opinion. Additionally, I don't know if uh, MassDEP could provide any tax breaks or credits for, um, you know, brownfields, uh, operations and, and looking at some of these capping projects that are completely upside down as far as um, financially. You know, it's, it's, it, it is really a, a tough position to be in um, right now with, with what's available and what our clients are trying to move. And I, I think Kate really hit the nail on the head. Well, you know, what we're seeing um, in, in the pipeline for bidding, I, I can name two jobs that would take Jason's capacity for the year that are on the table right now. 
Um, so, you know, th that's two projects. I think John Simpson er mentioned earlier that they, they do up to 400 projects a, a year. And I, of course, that's smaller jobs and larger jobs. But, you know, as a group, um, I'm just hoping that we can we can continue this conversation and, and, and maybe sit down and talk about, um, you know, some of the other opportunities like landfill expansion and the uh, RCS2 um, criteria, perhaps, it, it, you know, accepting some remediation waste, um, you know, I think that there's enough smart people on this, on this call and a lot of people that care um, about how this is affecting us to, to, to make it work. And we're willing as a company, um, we will be able to provide um, assistance with some of my employees and, and, and whatnot to, to help the situation. And I'm just glad that we're here today talking about it because it's, Sitting in my seat, it's 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 warm. So I uh, once again, I, I thank you guys for 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 hosting this, and hopefully we can open up after this and have some some general conversation. I know a lot of what I said is similar to what other people have said. I think we're a lot of us are on the same page, but you know we should uh, we should talk again, and hopefully uh, you know after today's today's meeting as well. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, next up is Ross Hartman, followed by Deborah Darby. Yeah, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, good morning, everybody. And um, to, uh, I guess, reiterate, thank you very much for uh, to the DEP and to the LSPA for putting this together. Needless to say, uh, this really struck uh, our interest as a company uh, at Strategic Environmental. Um, I didn't realize uh, the severity of some of the things that were, were going to occur uh, until I heard uh, Jason uh, from Waste Management speak a little while ago. So uh, it's, it's actually, it is great that we're having this dialogue, and I hope um, to, I guess, resonate in what uh, Bill French said. We can all keep working together to try to come up with a solution to this. So um, again, my name is Ross Hartman. I'm with Strategic Environmental Services. We're a uh, New England-based remedial contractor uh, with offices in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Connecticut. And we focus uh, primarily on site remediation. So we handle uh, a, a fair amount of our businesses associated with contaminated media being soil and, um, and contaminated debris. And as such, we spend quite a bit of time uh, working for environmental consultants and, uh, and uh, developers on the private development and, uh, and redevelopment of projects all, all throughout New England. Additionally, we uh, spend a fair amount of time in the public sector working for municipalities um, and also the DOT and MBTA in managing a fair amount of soil off of those jobs as they're going through um, road work or um, you know, up upgrading the infrastructure of the rail system, which I think is grossly important. <coughs> So uh, I'm, I'd like to touch upon a couple recent examples of, uh, of how this impact in the soil market has affected our company uh, and then get into some impacts of that and then um, some suggestions. Uh, we recently had a, a, a project in Northern Massachusetts for a, a large uh, private developer. It was a large residential project with some mixed use on site. Um, they discovered that there was asbestos in soil. There was a large amount of that material is somewhere between 30 and 50,000 tons of material. Um, we were in the middle of the project and, and uh, obviously things started to uh, shut down up north with the respective facilities. Uh, and that forced us to have to take a step back, look at some other options uh, and to, kind of reiterate what other people have said on the call. Uh, I think we're, you know, all the contractors are going through the sim similar circum circumstance where we're forced to have to look at these other disposal options that are much further away and that require transportation uh, at a much greater distance than staying in the local market. Um, we, we did that. We brought the uh, information back to the client. They uh, were willing to absorb some of the costs. As we started working, we realized trying to secure that many trucks to go that far was going to be a problem. And uh, we collectively all made a decision that it may be best to just shut the job down until we move into uh, 2022 and see what happens 
with the status of the market if things open back up. As you can imagine, that, that has an impact on a whole litany of, of aspects of the project. It has an impact on the construction sequence. It has an impact on us as an organization, has a, an impact on our revenues and our cash flow. And, um, but there's not much that you can do about it when it doesn't make finan financial sense. I think you need to go in a different direction. On the other side, we had a, recently we had a project on the Green Line extension where we were moving soil. Same thing happened, facility was shut down. Uh, we were forced to have to look for alternative disposal options. We, we, we did find one. It was significantly further away, uh, much, it was even further in upstate New York. Because of the project demands, uh, the, uh, the owner, uh, GLX essentially made the decision to move forward and transport that material because they, uh, they have certain timelines uh, and deadlines that they need to hit. Um, but that also brings some complications because you bid the job a certain way and then you're forced not to take the material to the location that you bid. There's an escalation cost. I think we're all dealing with that in the market um, and then we move forward. So uh, those are just two very quick examples amongst what turns out to be dozens of projects. I don't think there's one job that we have since August that hasn't been impacted by what has happened in the market. And I think we can all feel this slow build that's, that's going on. This process and this issue has been coming along for a good number of years. We've all identified that there are fewer landfill capacity options in Massachusetts, and it's been heading that way over the past 10 years. At one time, we had almost a dozen asphalt batch facility options that were available to us throughout New England. We're down to it, it, asphalt batching and thermal desorption. We're down to roughly three. So this has been occurring over a period of time. And I think when you take these issues with capacity issues, and then you mirror that with the fact that our regulations are such that we're exposing and uncovering uh, a lot more material in the market. The PCB bulk product issue caused issues because we were allowed to take that to local landfills. That started to fill up uh, landfill space. We're finding, a, I think, an inordinate amount of asbestos in soil than we did 10 years ago. And now we have on the horizon the whole PFOS issue. Um, and I don't think any of us really know how that's going to end up playing out. So we have a bit of a recipe here of um, not going in the opposite direction of of generating material on sites that are either being redeveloped developed, or there's infrastructure capacities with them. And I think when we, when we take all those issues, what effects the, does that end up having on all of us as, as a whole? Um, I, I personally get concerned about the economic scale of this, the disposal issues in, in our market. I think when we look at this from the lens of a developer, they're going to start seeing massive escalation costs on their projects. If we mirror, we mirror that with the likelihood that interest rates are going to end up raising, we are going to put ourselves in a position where we are going to end up pushing away developers from moving into the greater Boston area in order to um, purchase sites, redevelop them. If the cost of taking contaminated soil off of a site is going to outweigh that of the property value, it's a pretty easy uh, uh, formula for them. The first line item on a pro forma for developers or even a municipality is gonna be looking at what the environmental liabilities are. We're always the first one in. We're usually the ones that go in first, clean the site up and then turn it over to a company who is gonna end up building or uh, we're working alongside of a company who's gonna end up building. So if we're moving forward with the potential that people it, we're making it advantage or I guess disadvantage them to per, uh, purchase and develop sites. That's going to have an impact on all of us. And I think over the years, what's going on is Boston in the greater Boston area has been uh, really just thriving economically. And there's been so much develop, development going on in this area that they, the neighboring states can't keep up with the flow of material that's coming out of the Boston area. And we're evident by the fact that that's what happened up in ARC. This is what's going on uh, with Turnkey. And then we look at what happened in Rhode Island Resource Recovery. Everybody's starting to push 
away the material that's coming out of the great, greater Boston area. The concern with that is Boston is the heartbeat and it's the economic driver of just about all of New England. We all depend on Boston from Southern Maine, to Southern New Hampshire, to parts of Connecticut and a vast majority of Rhode Island to employ people and to uh, be able to use Boston as our economic engine, the same way Manhattan is for all of the boroughs and parts of New Jersey and Connecticut. And if we put ourselves in a position to not making this area economically viable to redevelop because there's just such a, a large cost associated with getting rid of soil and debris, that's gonna impact all of us. And there is a massive trickle down effect for each of us on this, on this call and all of us on, you know, in the industry as a whole. Several of us compete in the market uh, that, that, are, that have spoken today. However, we all end up working with each other in one form or another. And if all of these smaller type development jobs slow down and we can't figure out a way to get people enticed to purchase property because of these escalation costs, then uh, people aren't calling other companies for trucking and people aren't looking at certain sites that have RCS1, RCS2, or light soils associated with them if there's a larger component of that job of soil that has to go uh, out of state for disposal. I think the other issue that we're running into is, and it's already happening, we realize that there is a the flow capacity issue. So the next best option for us is let's try to ship it via rail. And when we go via rail, um, there's really one main outlet in Massachusetts out of Worcester that MHF ends up uh, um, operating that location. If we, that facility was primarily used for hazardous soil, a lot of Tosca soil left there, lead impacted VOC soil that was getting loaded out and shipped to points west to landfills. We start to use that location for non has soil at the size of the capacity of that location we're gonna have a massive bottleneck in that, in that terminal and it's gonna end up flowing downhill. We try to ship direct to go to points further north up in New York. I think it's, we're already seeing, it's very hard to find trucking outfits to go that far for a two day run to get rid of one load of material. I think somebody said that earlier. And you know, for us personally who, who own trucks, it, it is much easier knowing that if something happens with one of your trucks and you're local to New England, uh, you wanna stay in New England because you have the resources, you know the people, and you know the companies that can help in the event there's a problem with one of your, with one of your trucks. So we have a very good recipe here, I think, for uh, uh, identifying a problem. It's great that we're all talking about this. And I, I don't think there's one single point solution to this. I, I think when you listen to a lot of what other people have recommended. There's some great ideas around the regulatory issues. Um, I do think that we should really take a hard look at certain rail sightings. And if there's a way to open up permits where we could take more material into those rails, I think we absolutely have to look into the landfill space. And I know it's really hard in the state of Massachusetts to uh, try to reopen a landfill or to, to change regulation to accept a higher degree of soil. But um, I, I think that that's a, a really uh, high, uh, you know, option that needs to be put on the table. Lastly, one option I think to look at is Connecticut has a general permit where they allow for the placement of non-has soils to go onto a storage pad, and then it can be loaded back out and, and either transloaded or moved to a facility, and the material can sit on the pad for a certain period of time. I, I think that could be very beneficial with a lot of projects that end up going, we're going through a massive overhaul of infrastructure for our utilities, uh, for, for um, the energy utilities, and they're upgrading a lot of their lines and they're generating a tremendous amount of soil. And if we had a place where some of that could go staged, transloaded out, I think that would be of a, of a great benefit for the economy as a whole. So um, that is it. Uh, to reiterate what uh, Bill French said, I really look forward to communicating more about this down the road. I think that this is a problem that we all should be very vested in, um, and, and especially in light of where things are, are headed from um, you know, an, an economic standpoint. So thank you for the time, and um, I hope we have the chance to do this again. Thanks very much, Ross. Hey, next up is Deborah Darby. 
And after Deborah is Kelly McQueenie, and Kelly will be the last scheduled speaker, so we'll have time to open up uh, to the broader audience. Hi, my name is Deborah Darby. Um, I work for the MBTA. I was initially hired to um, oversee uh, traditional MCP cleanups, and my job morphed into um, working on construction projects. So mainly, um, my job entails now in working on construction projects. And um, my interest in soil projects at the MBTA started maybe 14, 15 years ago when I was tasked with revising our specifications. And um, my aha moment came at the second revision of our soil um, excavation specification where I realized there was a lot of benefit for soil reuse within the footprint of the project. So during that revision, um, I worked with some very um, smart LSPs, PMs, um, and the like. We were able to come up with a, a means where we could facilitate soil reuse. It wasn't until um, major um, soil movement projects like South Coast Rail and GLX where the full effect of taking a reuse approach was realized. Um, some of you know or may not know, both of these projects generate or is estimated to generate at least a million tons of excavated materials. And that's, that's a lot of material. Um, both of these projects did have a reuse element, but what I'm gonna highlight is, um, because it's, there's a lot of, I don't know much about, you know, capacities and how to, you know, expand capacity at landfills. But what I can tell you is, it is a very beneficial tool to, to allow construction projects to utilize materials within the footprint of the project as well as inter projects. And um, Kate touched upon that briefly in her, her um, presentation. So I'm gonna tell you a little success as you know, we need a little good news. <laughs> um, South Coast Rail was primarily designed as a reuse project. So they designed the project to reuse 75% of the materials. And we worked with the uh, Southeast Regional U um, Region to come up with a plan to do this. And with Southeast Regional Unit, um, Southeast Region, I'm trying to talk fast to stay on, on target, um, said to us, you can reuse this material. And we're talking about soils that had high arsenic um, levels above um, imminent hazards. You can reuse this within the new alignment of your tracks. However, you can't reuse this anyplace else. And so we took that and ran with it. And as a result, we are estimating at least 300,000, that's the estimate I was given, but, um, of materials will be reused in the realignment of our tracks. Um, and that translates into a savings, both from the export of, of materials to um, reuse and disposal facilities, as well as on the import side of bringing in virgin materials to you know, raise the grades, et cetera, to about $14,750,000, which I think is a win-win all around. It's a win-win in saving landfill and um, recycle um, off-site disposal reuse facilities. It's a win-win on the um, we uh, uh, using new materials or importing virgin materials into um, track areas. And it's a win-win for the taxpayers because of the large dollar amount. Now, some of you might be asking, well, 75%, why stop there? Why not go to 100%? Well, our hands were tied. Um, the Southeast region's hands were tied because the regulations require or define um, railroad right of way as the active track bed. What the T is looking for um, to allow us more flexibility in how we use excavated materials is to redefine the definition of an active right of way to include 
all infrastructure and assets that are required for the use of operating and maintaining an active transit system. And how this is realized is that now we can put excavated materials, we can consider parking lots, under parking lots, which all commuter rail stations have associated parking lots. We can put it in the foundations or beneath the foundations of stations and buildings. We could also then look at our layover facilities and you know, eventually we're gonna have to raise those tracks um, to deal with climate change. And that materials can be put there or it can be put in maintenance track areas up to the building so that we can, you know, divert a lot of this materials away from um, the, the limited resource of disposal and reuse facilities. So that, that's one of the asks that we're looking for. Um, I want to piggyback on what Kate was saying about interproject um, import export. The T at the point, at this point, um, we're at a, you know, beginning a 30% design um, project where there are two projects. One project has an extensive cut where we're, they will be building an underground um, parking garage for employees. The other project has a significant fill aspect to it in that we are purchasing property to expand a, 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 a layover maintenance facility and we need to raise the track. Would it be great if I could take that export from the cut project and transport that over to the fill project? But when I talk about this from an ideological perspective, you know, I get chuckles from the LSP that I'm discussing this with because the regulations don't allow us to do this. And one of the main impediments of that is the liability issue. And I hear that magic L word all peppered all throughout the discussions that have happened previous to mine, liability, liability, liability. So we definitely need to figure out a way to um, deal with that in a responsible way so that you can have inter-project sharing, you know, of cut and fill materials. So um, the T is extremely interested in how this conversation goes. We are, you know, that's been my mantra. I guess if I had to have a crown or a title, my crown and title will be reuse soil and ballast materials don't necessarily consider disposal unless you have nothing else you can do with it. And in order for us to you know, um, realize that we definitely need regulatory uh, relief or assistance in figuring it out how this can, can work. And, and I'm glad that private industries are, are also looking at, you know, these types of things. So that it's not like, well, we, you know, we need you to do this for us. It's not just specific to the MBTA. So we, um, I'm, I'm very much interested in this topic and I am available to continue the discussion. Um, and I am grateful for the opportunity to add my two cents to this conversation. Thank you, Deborah. Okay, next up is Kelly McQueenie. And that thank will you. be the end. I'm sure everyone's looking forward to that. Um, I wanna thank Mass DAP and the LSPA again for hosting this. This has been uh, really eye-opening and uh, a wonderful format for us to be able to share our experiences. And I'll, I'll try not to reiterate what everyone else has said. So um, I'm Kelly McQueenie. I work with Harvard University Environmental Health and Safety, Director of Project Support Services. And we consult with our project, our capital projects to help uh, manage eh &S issues and risk management. Um, and so Harvard conducts excavation of soils as part of our maintenance, as well as our capital projects. And Harvard recently with this development partner are starting the first phase of the Enterprise Research Campus located in Alston that requires extensive excavation of fill soils. And the first phase encompasses about uh, 10 acres of land 
The first phase of that will have about 900,000 square feet of planned development. So a lot of soil removal in the next few years for us. Um, similarly, we um, the quality of the fill required that we take the material to New Hampshire and Maine. And our first project was the roads and infrastructure that started at the beginning of uh, this year. And we were slated to go up to the facilities in New Hampshire and Maine. We were recently told that uh, they've reached capacity so that we have to be diverted to the Fairport New York facility, which as others have said, is difficult to find drivers to go that far. It also created um, about a 170% cost increase per ton for uh, shipping those soils up to Fairport New York. We uh, unfortunately, due to the nature of the fill, um, MassDEP has not allowed us to stockpile more than a small amount of soil, even though we have a plenty of room to do so. So we did have to significantly slow the uh, last bit of that project because of the unavailability of the disposal facilities and the limited uh, quantities that the New York facility can, can handle. Um, so we are advising all of our other projects to wait until the beginning of the year to uh, generate soils. And uh, we are looking at all options for uh, taking care of the soils that we will be generating in the future, uh, also considering rail. As you know, it's difficult to find the um, containers to do that, and the shipping costs uh, via rail are much more than uh, trucking locally. Um, so we are planning for our future excavations. Um, one thing I did want to hit on and reiterate through uh, Dave and others' uh, point is the emissions the uh, additional emissions that are generated from trucking so far for this soil. And I know that uh, we, the state of Massachusetts does has a very, have a very aggressive goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions to 45% below 1990 levels. And if we're looking just at this sector, as far as diesel emissions, uh, we're just increasing and increasing our diesel emissions due to this, this issue. Um, in 1990, we had uh, 573 landfills available for uh, disposal. And uh, fortunately, we have cleaned that, uh, closed those up, but that's not a, not a bad thing, but we have nowhere else to take our soils. So it's, um, if we are looking to try and reach that goal of even just getting to 1990 emission levels, it's, it's not going to happen uh, unless we can figure out how to manage these soils locally. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Kelly. Okay. So I think we have a a few minutes to open the floor. And I, I did promise the first slot uh, to John Haas. Uh, okay. Uh, John, you can unmute. Great, thank you everybody. And again, thanks to the Mass DEP and LSPA and everybody that's on this call, really, really great and powerful discussions. Um, so to, I, I'm a, my name is John Haas, I'm a regional sales manager of TerraTherm, uh, headquartered in Carter, Massachusetts. Uh, we're a thermal remediation contractor and we use thermal remediation in the subsurface and in above ground excavated piles of soil to treat things like petroleum hydrocarbons, CVOCs, SVOCs, MGO, MGP waste, PCBs, 1,4-dioxane, PFAS, and other constituents. We get a lot of calls from clients that want to look at options other than soil disposal for any number of different reasons. One reason being what we're all talking about today, specifically uh, reductions in issues with soil disposal capacity in landfills. So this session really caught my eye because one, there are a number of different areas of situations where in situ thermal remediation can be effective and very successful. One is where uh, there may be a construction project going on, redevelopment project going on, and stakeholders are struggling with what to do with contaminated soils. One of the options can be in situ thermal remediation. Uh, here at TerraTherm, We've worked, we work on sites all over the country. Uh, we worked on sites in Massachusetts, specifically in North Adams, uh, Haunton, Lowell, Groveland. We're currently speaking with two local consultants about uh, two different industrial facilities here in Massachusetts. And ironically enough, although TerraTherm isn't the thermal contractor on the project, in situ thermal is currently being used uh, at the general chemical site in Framingham. 
I'm sure a lot of people have done, everyone on this call knows about that site for sure. So, you know, I didn't want to make this a sales pitch by any means, it's not a shameless plug. Really just want to let folks know that if you're working on a project and you're struggled and challenged with what to do with contaminated soils, think a little bit about things outside the box, so to speak, other than disposal. Think about in situ thermal or ex situ thermal. Uh, be very successful, very cost effective. So, once again, thanks to everybody on the call. I appreciate your time. Thanks, John. Um, I think we have a few raised hands. Paul, I don't know if you saw what order these came up, but yep, uh, they, they show up at the top of the screen in the order that they raise their hands. So, okay. uh, Ned first. Ned, I think you can unmute. I uh, did. Thank you. Um, so uh, what I wanted to do is to try, I'm, I'm, uh, my name's Ned Abelson, I'm an environmental lawyer with Goulson and Stores. Uh, I sit on the Superfund Advisory Committee uh, in the commercial real estate seat. And so I wanted to try and provide a little perspective uh, from that uh, angle, from that place of touching the elephant, even though I'm not a developer myself. Um, to start, I, I agree with what uh, most other people have said, first in terms of thanking both DEP and the LSPA for increasing the focus on this issue. Um, I think it's really important for all the reasons that have been presented by the folks who have spoken before me. Um, and I'm also gonna try not to repeat everybody's comments, uh, but on the capacity issue uh, with respect to which there seems to be pretty clear agreement, uh, one of the things that happens from the real estate perspective, just to emphasize something that was touched on previously, is uh, occasionally in the midst of construction and excavation and offsite disposal, uh, facilities shut down and your list of approved facilities needs to expand immediately, which doesn't happen immediately. And so it can, depending on the specific part of the excavation you're in, it can be remarkably disruptive to a project that's already underway. Um, second, uh, as noted by others, we have the remarkable, not quite unique, but very unusual good fortune in the Boston area of having an economic engine that continues to chug along uh, very, very well. Um, in terms of the focus of um, those types of businesses that wanna be downtown and excavate and do that sort of thing, uh, we still, we're very fortunate indeed in terms of the, uh, the biotech focus and the lab focus. Uh, but one of the other things that's happening in the real estate development market is lots of other costs are going through the roof. Uh, and so what, how does that come back to this issue? It means there's less ability to absorb uh, the increased costs that are associated with the soil management issues we've been discussing. Um, in addition, from a real estate perspective, as with any business, Certainty is critical, uh, and uh, as everyone who's spoken before me has indicated, uh, we're in very uncertain times uh, with things pointed in the wrong direction at the moment in terms of this issue in particular. Uh, and as at least one person who spoke before me mentioned, um, one of the safety valves that was available before uh, when you were doing a big dig and haul project uh, in the form of the tax credits is way, way less than it used to be. I don't, I don't think developers really use that in their pro forma at this point. Um, one point that I don't think has been focused on, but I think everybody um, would agree is obvious is this problem has a long lead time to solve. Uh, and so it's not like we're gonna fix it tomorrow. And so I think that's another important reason that it needs focus. Uh, and um, as much as just a, a citizen of the Commonwealth, I can't believe sending things to Ohio is the right solution. Um, that can't be good for the environment. Um, I wasn't aware of what remarkable impacts it has to budgets. Um, that, that just doesn't seem like a, 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 a helpful solution. And the last thought in terms of a possible solution um, is perhaps there's a way to create a parallel to the current ACO process uh, that applies with respect to less than RCS1 soils. That's been terrific in large part because much like the MCP, uh, it really is self-implementing. And once it's set up, uh, it moves along quite nicely. Um, at least from my perspective, that's been quite a success. I don't know if there are other issues that have come from it, 
but uh, that certainly seems like an approach that's worked very well in terms of the problem it was designed uh, to address. Uh, thanks for your time. Thanks, Ned. Uh, David, David Foss. Thank you. Um, I know I said I had one comment, but I have three. So one is I totally stand behind both what Ned just said and Carrie and Kate about uh, kind of the environmental justice and, and equity challenges. Um, you know, Metro Boston has got big finances and a lot of people are spending money there. Our other gateway cities are having a really hard time and development projects are on a razor thin margin. And so it doesn't take much and certainly the, uh, the, the lack of certainty in Brownfields tax credits is a problem, but the, it doesn't take much and a change in soil management cost can kill Brownfields redevelopment in cities and neighborhoods that really need it. And we're seeing a really big in inequality um, in how that pro those projects are going forward. Um, the, so my other, my other comment, and it's just kind of the, the invisible elephant in the room in the parts petroleum category is PFAS, it's out there in soil, I mean, it, it, Maine, one of the reasons Maine is not taking a lot of soil is because they're worried about biosolids that are coming their way that are probably loaded with, with PFAS. And I know that this is new. We've only been dealing with it for a couple of years. But if we start testing for PFAS in soil, whether that's within RCS1 or COM97 or whatever the category of soil is, and we start finding it, we're not too far away from those being considered a hazardous waste. And we will have now taken a huge volume of soil in the Commonwealth that might be in a very different category for management. So I think in the world of what waste site cleanup and solid waste need to think about is as we test for these compounds, what are the implications on like killing massive development projects or uh, the, the challenge that will come with facing, facing those compounds. So thank you, appreciate your time. And I really appreciate everyone's uh, comments and contributions today. Thanks, David. Uh, Dawn? Don Nagel. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Don Nagel. I'm an environmental attorney uh, representing a soil fill project called Maryland's Landing in Bridgewater that accepts below RCS2 soils. It's a COM15 site, but it's also a site assigned under the solid waste regulations. Um, so on the positive side of this conversation, um, I offer an immediate opportunity for creating additional capacity at landfills is to divert remediation waste from landfills that are below RCS2 to these kinds of sites. Um, if acceptance of remediation waste at these levels were allowed, it would help alleviate demand for a limited landfill space or the need to truck the soils out of state at great expense. Uh, the soil acceptance criteria wouldn't have to change. Uh, currently, Maryland's Landing uh, is approved to accept soils up to uh, RCS2, but can accept these same soils that are from 21E sites. Um, so Maryland's Landing is partnered with Republic Industries, which owns an adjoining closed landfill to create over 2 million tons of airspace for these soils. Um, so a short-term solution which doesn't require any regulatory changes that would mitigate the shortage of disposal space for soils above RCS2 would be to approve acceptance of soils that are less than RCS2 at facilities like Maryland's Landing. So I offer that for your consideration that can be done fairly quickly without any making any regulatory changes. Thank you. Thank you, Don. I don't see any additional hands raised. So um, I'm, I'm really impressed with the timing today. Um, oh, and, oh, oh, Jason Barroso <laughs> is added. Is it, is it Jason? Yep. Yep. Uh, Jason, go ahead. Hi, guys. I'm sorry. I just wanted to point out um, it didn't come up in um, it didn't come up in my conversation, but I think it's important to note, and it's another uh, sign of the times that um, waste management, and I, I believe other facilities that operate subtitle D landfills with leachate collection and liners and that sort of thing, we've already um, stopped voluntarily reviewing less than RCS1, less than RCS2 uh, materials. So it, it's 
our capacity concern is unrelated to those materials. I mean, that may impact unlined, um, but we've already voluntarily uh, pushed those materials away a couple of years ago. Okay, thank you, Jason. And uh, Bill? Okay. Yes, um, I guess my, um, my question would be is where do we go from here? I mean, obviously this was a, a great jumping off point, but um, like Don and others have said, like we, we I, I know we can't do something immediately, but you know, with the holidays and whatnot, obviously it's gonna, some time's gonna pass, but how do we, do we reconvene? How do we do this? How do we, how do we come together as a group or, or formulate some strategies sooner than later so that we aren't, you know, six months or a year from now having the conversation I, I brought up about the online landfills because those really are the facilities that are taking the rate the most regulated waste. Um, you know, the ACO facilities are taking most material, but I'm talking regulated soils. Those four online landfills are all coming to a head. So how do we how do we reconvene or when do we reconvene and what's the path forward? Well, thank you for that comment. And um, I, from Mass DEP's part, and I'll, I'll let Paul speak to this as well, because Paul, you know, looks across both the waste site cleanup program as well as the solid waste program. But we want to take what we heard today, um, you know, some of the sobering information, as well as some of these suggestions, um, take them back, discuss them more, pull the right people together to have those discussions and keep this conversation going with this group of stakeholders. Um, so that's that's generally we, what we uh, plan on doing with this information. Paul, did you wanna? Yeah, uh, a couple of things. First, I, I would um, give thanks to a number of the folks out there that, who have uh, periodically raised this to the commissioner, uh, Marty Suberg, uh, so it's something that our commissioner is aware of. Uh, uh, Stephanie Cooper, who I am acting for uh, for the time being, uh, was also uh, had been made aware of it. So it's an issue that has been percolating up. And I think we do have a, an opportunity now, uh, particularly since I'm sitting where I'm sitting for the moment, uh, to, to make some headway in it. And one of the things that I think we can use uh, to keep it in the forefront, uh, kind of keep the impetus going, is we are spending a lot of time, or have been over the past month or two, uh, looking at um, the funding that is coming our way, uh, first through the ARPA uh, bill and now through the, uh, the federal infrastructure bill. Uh, there are going to be a lot of uh, infrastructure construction projects happening in Massachusetts over the next five years. So if you think that the real estate market has been hot and the construction industry has been uh, running hot of the past few years, it's not going to slow down. And I think the um, that is one of the reasons why it will remain uh, kind of uh, elevated in our eyes and kind of there will be some pressure, which is good uh, on the department to try to find some solutions. And as many of you pointed out, th there's no one silver bullet for all of this. It's going to be a collection of, of tweaking here, adjusting there, maybe some big project, uh, big efforts that are going to take longer, but we do need to look at um, kind of all the different pieces and see what we can, we can uh, work with. Uh, both in the short term and the long term. So in, in the very short term, uh, it's good that the holidays are coming up. Uh, that will give us a, a chance, one, to go through all of your comments and organize them. And one of the things we'll, we'll do is try to summarize that and put it on the website. So we'll, we'll see both the options and the suggestions that have come in. Uh, I think it will be really good to have in one place kind of a summary of the, the pressures and the challenges that we're all facing. And not just the private sector, but uh, we've heard from a number of uh, folks from the public sector uh, on how it is affecting you know, state-driven projects as well. Uh, and so once we have that, we'll put it out, uh, circulate among you guys, we'll put it on the web, make sure we get it, get it all together 
uh, I would encourage anybody listening and everybody who has spoken, if you have anything else to contribute, any other suggestions, you know, send it in. Uh, that would be very helpful. And then we'll try to set up an, another meeting with initial thoughts uh, earlier, you know, early to mid Jan, probably more like mid January, but uh, on the early side of, of January for that. Uh, Greg Cooper from our solid waste, our, our Bureau of Air and Waste. Uh, uh, has raised his hand. Greg. Yeah, hi. Well, I just wanted to kind of mention to folks if they aren't plugged in, we have been looking at our solid waste regulations, both the facility siting and the facility management regulations over the past, oh, probably year. We've had a couple of stakeholder meetings on reg updates, uh, reg revisions. Uh, we had one uh, just back in September. Um, we probably, uh, the, the proposal is for us to try to go out with some reg revisions um, in 2022. So um, I will try to include the link uh, or have Liz send that out to where we're trying to take comments, but certainly welcome people's inputs in this uh, avenue on the topic. Obviously, there's overlap. And um, we're looking at reg revisions and, and what we can do uh, on a whole host of things. And, uh, you know, your comments would be appreciated. Sounds good. Thanks, Greg. So with that, um, I think we're at the end here and I, I'd really uh, like to thank all of you for participating, um, the people that commented and all of you that uh, tuned in and stayed with us. Um, it's been a great session. I've, I've learned a lot, I know. Um, and as I said, we'll, we'll keep this going and uh, keep in touch with you. Uh, check back. Um, at that link where we'll be posting information and updates. And um, wishing you all a happy holiday season. And thanks again. Yep. Thank, Thank you me. all.